So what we're going to see today is we're going to see the significance of sin and really how it plays out in kind of double time here. As what we'll see is, is, is almost a cycle of sin. And first we're going to see it played out in the life of Ananias and then we're going to see it played out exactly the same way in the life of Sapphira, his wife. So first we're going to see sin as planned and played out. And, and we have notes in your bulletin if you'd like to Go ahead and fill those out, and, and they'll be up on, on the screen later. And we're going to see this planned and played out of sin in verses 1 to 2, and then we're going to see it later in verses 7 to 8 with Sapphira. Then we'll see sin is exposed in verses 3 and 4, and then later with Sapphira in verse 9. Then the third point that we will see is sin is punished. And we'll see that in the first half of verse 5, and then we'll see it in verse 10 and the life of Sapphira as well. And finally, we'll see that sin is seen as significant. We'll see that in the second half of verse 5 and 11. And really, as, as Luke pens chapter 5 here, I believe what he's doing is he's, is he's thinking back to Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 43, which said that everyone was filled with awe over what God was doing. And I believe what he's doing is he's taking that idea and he's developing it throughout this entire section and he's expanding it and explaining and giving us an example of this is the reason why everyone was filled with awe and this respect of, of who God is. And really what we're going to see is the significance of sin. That, that, that sin is significant. It is serious. And we can see this as, as the destructive power of sin is seen in the life of Ananias and Sapphira. And in particular, their sin of greed and deceit. But, but I believe also the word of God represents something here that shows us the honesty of, of God's word. And the fact of, the, up to this point, all that we've seen of the inner life of the church is really the good side, right? Up to this point, if all that we'd ever been told of the church of Jerusalem in the beginning days was up to chapter 4, verse 37, we might walk away and think, oh my, this was a perfect church. And that none of us actually could have gone to that church because we would have messed things up. And yet the reality is that this is not the perfect church either. That what happens? Sin enters this church, as did Satan. And, and what does God want us to understand? He wants us to understand that the church isn't perfect. And yet he also wants us to understand the significance of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit is mentioned, not once, not twice, but three times in, in these short 11 verses and, and in this story. And the Holy Spirit is a main figure, a main character in this story. As is Ananias and Sapphira and Peter. And in fact, I would say the Holy Spirit actually takes precedence and more em emphasis than the others. And why is that? Why is the Holy Spirit so emphasized? Because it, it, it's, it's a warning from the Lord that we are to recognize that sin and anything that goes against what the Holy Spirit and what His Word would tell us is right and in accordance to God's word. Anything that misses the mark, that it hinders the expression of, of the unity, the love, and the holiness of the fellowship that we're supposed to have as believers. So, so let's, let's look at, at these verses and, and, and see the significance of sin. As first, what we're going to see is, is sin is, is planned and then it's played out. Look, look at verses 1 to 2 with me. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and in bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. So the first word that Luke uses in order to describe now what's about to happen is this word but, which we know happens to be used as a, as a point of contrast. So now what he's doing is he's contrasting that which happened before, what, which with that which is now about to happen. So he's pointing back to Barnabas. And he's saying, okay, that, as we saw last week, that is a good example. That is a good model of somebody who was 
listening and being controlled by the Holy Spirit, somebody who's being empowered by the Holy Spirit, and being gracious in the way that He is giving. And now, in contrast to that, He's going to show us someone who is not allowing the Holy Spirit to control them, but is more concerned about people and what they think of them than about what God thinks and even about the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And then he gives us the names of them so that we would know exactly who they are. These are true historical figures. They really did live. This isn't some story that somebody made up. Just as he gave us the name of Barnabas, who was the son of encouragement back at the end of chapter 4, he now gives us these two names, Ananias and Sapphira. And their names are significant because Ananias, his name in Hebrew means Yahweh is gracious. And I would say that Yahweh has been gracious to Ananias because we learned last week that it wasn't the norm for someone to even have land during this time. That that separated and put, put them in, in, in kind of a, a different class there in the social system, right? They, they were more of the rich and the famous. So God had been gracious. And then his wife's name is Sapphira. And in Aramaic, her name means beautiful. And yet she's, she's far from beautiful in God's sight. And he's far from gracious. And I believe what God's really trying to get across is is that yes, these have they they both have nice names and they have these deep meanings with, with their names, but nothing is more heinous and detestable in God's sight than those who flaunt a spiritual beauty which they do not possess, who play church, but their hearts are far from him who are only concerned with with what others are thinking and are not concerned about with what God is thinking. And so then we see what they do, or what he does in particular, as, as he sells a piece of property and he kept back some. This word kept back, this verb is, is very telling. In fact, it's it's used in Joshua 7.1 in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So the translators use the same exact word for describing Achan. Who, when, when the nation of Israel conquered Jericho, he did what God told him not to do and he stole some of that which was left over after they conquered when the Lord had said, hey, don't take any booty from this place, all all the things that are left over now that you've overcome this people, you need to leave everything because it's to be devoted to the Lord. So this was something that didn't even belong to Achan, but he took it. Contrasted, no doubt, and and I believe that, that most of the Jews that would have been listening at this time to Peter, that they would have understood, oh yes, that, that reminds me of Achan. He took that which didn't belong to him that God told him not to take, that was to be devoted to the Lord. And now what's Ananias doing? He's taken actually that which belongs to him and making it look like that he's being more gracious and generous and self-sacrificing than he really is. And in essence, what what this is depicting is this is the, the sin of hypocrisy. Where all someone is concerned with is what others think more than what God thinks. And so you end up living this double life. And and they're living this, or at this point, Ananias is living this double life. He's saying, okay, look at how pious and gracious I am. And not only is it hypocrisy, making himself look better, but 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 then it goes on and it and it says that that he he did this with his wife's full knowledge. That, that this union that God had brought, the blessing of marriage, this institution of, of marriage where, where the two become one, that instead of using that wonderful bond in order to encourage each other in godliness and to grow and to challenge each other, it, it's, it's used for, for something wrong in, in order to, to lie and to cheat and to be more and more deceptive. And in, and in some cases, it, it reminds me of, of, of Adam and Eve a little bit. I don't know exactly the way that this would have planned out and how they did this, but at some point, 
They sell the property, they get the money, and then I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that there must have been some sort of conversation. Okay, honey, you know, Barnabas, he gave everything, and now we, man, look at all this money that we have. Man, it sure would be nice to take a little bit of this and use it to make an addition to the house. How about we get some new cows? How about we get a new horse? I, I, I don't know. And then she, oh, really? That, man, that, that would be nice. And before you know it, they've constructed this whole little plan. And, and, then, and the kicker is they say, and you know what? Only you and I would know about it. Only you and I. Man, we, we, we'd look so good. We'd be just like Barnabas. Wouldn't that be cool? And so then what do they do? They, they, they bring a portion of it. And in, in some cases, it, it does. It reminds me of, of Genesis 3. And Adam and Eve, as is, is Eve then you know, hands the fruit to Adam. And at that point, what, what would have happened if Adam would have said, whoa, no, we can't do this? Well, that isn't what happens. And as we're going to see, that isn't the way that even Sapphira replies. But what we see is Satan, just as he came into the garden, in order to wreak havoc, in order to wreak, dis wreak destruction, in order to break what? The fellowship that Adam and Eve were enjoying with God in the garden. Remember, there was no sin before that point. They were enjoying sweet fellowship daily with God. And what does Satan do? He comes in and he wants to break that fellowship. And now what is he doing in the church? The same exact thing. Because what was the early church enjoying? They were enjoying fellowship with one another, and they were enjoying fellowship with their God in a sweet, sweet way. And so now what happens is Satan comes in to the church, just as he came into the garden, with the idea of breaking the fellowship. That just as he approached the first married couple, he's now coming into this married couple in order to reap, reap destruction upon the church. And so what, what do they do? They, he brings a portion of it. This again is contrasting, pointing back to what Barnabas brought. Because this word in the Greek actually brings about the, this idea, a portion of the whole that there was more that they didn't bring, whereas Barnabas brought it all. And then we see quickly that sin is exposed. Look at verse 3 with me. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Again, it starts off with that contrast word. In contrast to really what you have just done, Ananias, portraying yourself like you're this gracious, godly man, the reality is you are not that man. The reality is, is you are a liar. And the reality is, Ananias, Satan has come and he's filled your heart. And, and who is Satan? Well, well, we know that Satan is the adversary. That Satan is the enemy of God and all those who belong to God. And he wants nothing more than to reap destruction upon the church and upon Christ's children. And the way in which the questions phrased in the Greek, it suggests that the heart of Ananias was, was filled by Satan so as to move him to lie to the Holy Spirit. It's like a, by tempting him. Hey, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Which brings me to the point of a question that I think we all need to consider. Is spiritual warfare real? Now I know normally when I bring that, oh, well, yes, Pastor Jason, we know that you were a missionary. You lived among the, this remote people group that no doubt that man, the spiritual warfare was great there. But, but here in America, probably not so much, really. You think Satan has just gone underground? That, that since Acts chapter 5, he said, hey, you know, that was great. We tried. It didn't really work. Okay, I give up. No, Satan is still alive and well. But think about this. Can you say, oh yes, I've been tempted by Satan. Be before you answer that too quickly, let me remind you that Satan, for one, is a created being. 
And for two, he is not omnipresent, meaning he's not everywhere at one time. He's not like God. He's not omniscient. He doesn't have all knowledge. He doesn't have all power. Is he powerful? Yes. Does he want your destruction? Yes. But I think far too many people give him far too much credit. Oh, the devil made me do it. Really? Of all the people in the world, do you think the devil came after you? Most likely it was possibly one of his demons. I I think more often... It's my own flesh and my own my heart pulling me away. But here we know exactly what was happening. We know that Satan knew exactly what was going on in this church and he didn't like it. And so what did he want to do? He wanted to stop it. He wanted to break the fellowship just as he broke the fellowship in the garden. And so he comes after Ananias. And it says that what did he that he filled his heart. This isn't the same word used in the last section that we looked at where Peter was filled with the Spirit, meaning that he was controlled by the Spirit. It's more the idea of of literally being filled, such as with water or like on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, with, with the room being filled with noise that was like a rushing wind. But exactly how the filling and, and all of that happened, I, I don't believe that that's the most important part of, of this text. It's, it's the idea that we know that Satan comes and approaches him and, and, and tempts him. Tempts him in order to do what? In order to lie. And misrepresent himself. And yet we also see where he does it, that, that Satan doesn't come and try to tempt him in some other way, but he comes to his heart. And, and that is because all sin begins at the heart. The heart, again, is the control center of the base of operations from which all of our actions emerge. And and in this, what what we're really being revealed to us is Satan's game plan. He he basically has a two-fold plan for attacking the church, for destroying the church of Christ. And and we saw the beginning of the plan rolled out in chapter 4. And and that is the attack from the outside. He wants to destroy the church from the outside or from without. And and what we saw in chapter 4 was he he tried to do it through the Sanhedrin. But that didn't work. Actually what it did is is it made them more bold, more courageous. And so now what does he do? He goes through his second plan, which is, okay, he wants to destroy the church from within. And does that not happen a lot these days? From within. Factions within a church. Someone failing morally or what have you. And then what happens? Division. That's what Satan wants. He wants to destroy the church from within. And then we see exactly how this is depicted. That that he's, what? He lied to the Holy Spirit and kept back some of the price. Well, wait a minute. I thought he was was lying to Peter and to the apostles. And it says, well, yes, he was lying to Peter and to the apostles, but even more importantly, he was lying to the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because it is the Spirit of God that that creates new believers and puts them in to the church that then fills and sustains them, empowers them. But even in this, I don't believe Peter's major issue with Ananias is the amount of money that he was giving. Because no doubt it could have been an extremely large amount of money. But it was the fact that that he was given the money and making it look like he was given more than he actually was. It's his integrity. And is that not something that we should fight for, that we should ask the Lord to keep building in us? That we would indeed be men and would be children of God that live out what God's word says. And, And what's happening here is he lacks integrity. He's only bringing a part while pretending to bring the whole. They wanted the credit and the prominence of of being considered one of those within the body who gave so generously and so graciously. But they wanted that reputation without the inconvenience or the personal cost. They, They wanted to shortchange it. And so we see that their motive in giving 
It wasn't for the better of the body. It wasn't to glorify God, but it was for their own egos. It was to make themselves look good. And then he goes on, and, and, and Peter explains a little bit more so that we're not confused as to exactly what was going on. Look at what he says in verse 4. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So here's the idea. He's saying, okay, before you sold it, was this land not your own? Yes. Implication, you didn't have to sell it. You could have done with it whatever you wanted. Other implication, okay, once you sold it, was it not now still under your authority to do with that money whatever you wanted to do? A.K.A., you didn't have to bring it and lay it at the apostles' feet. You could have done whatever you wanted with the money. Within reason that fell into what would be appropriate according to God's word. But his point was, it was yours to do with whatever you wanted, Ananias. It was your choice. You didn't have to sell this land. You had the liberty to do with, what, with it whatever you saw best. But instead, you seek human praise above the praise of God. And then he says this. He says, why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? To conceive means to contrive something, to, to come up with a plan. Really what he's saying is, why did you yourself come up with this plan in your heart? Well, wait a minute, Pastor Jason. I just thought previous verses said that, that it was Satan that, that filled his heart. So, so is it Satan that's doing this, or, or is this Ananias? Wh which one? And I would say it's not Satan or Ananias. It's Satan and Ananias. An Ananias isn't taken out of the equation, and he can say, oh, well, well, Satan made me do it. No, he's still held responsible for what he does. And so it's both and. That yes, Satan does come and tempts him. But here's the thing. Ananias could have resisted the temptation of Satan. But he chose not to. And so ultimately, how does Peter phrase it? He says, you've lied not to men, but to God. And what's he doing there? He's equating, this is where a lot of people go in the Bible to prove that the Holy Spirit is indeed God. Because in the first verse he says, oh, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Now he's saying, you lied to God. He's equating them, saying the Holy Spirit is indeed God. But there's another aspect of the Holy Spirit which is so important for us to understand that is described here, that is presented to us. And that is the fact that the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force. He's not some mystic thing out there that you kind of tap into, some cloud. He's a person. How do we know this? Because he can be lied to. And, and what we see next is he shouldn't have lied to the Holy Spirit as sin is punished. Look at verse 5. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The, this, this term breathed his last. All the time that it appears in the New Testament, it, it's always talking about somebody who is struck down by divine judgment. That God is the one orchestrating this. That God is the agent. God is the one who caused this to happen. And yet it's interesting, as I read different commentators, they, they were all over the map onto why this happened. Some would say, oh, you know what the real reason was? Is he had a heart attack. And it was brought on by anxiety because of Peter. If Peter hadn't made such a public spectacle of him and made him look so bad, then this wouldn't have happened. No, it had nothing to do with that. It was God that was doing this. And God is the one who is ultimately responsible for the death. And then we, then we see this. The result of that is that a great fear came over all who heard of it. This fear isn't speaking of, of, of being in terror or being in panic. It's, it's deeper than that. It's a healthy respect or awe or reverence of God at his displayed power. 
that, that they have seen something so awesome that nothing else could explain it, and they recognize, oh my, this is a holy, righteous God who can do whatever he pleases because he is altogether different than any of us. And as a result of that, they're in reverence, they're in awe of who this God is. But if you're like me, maybe at times as you're thinking about this, you might start to think, yeah, but Pastor Jason, doesn't this seem a, a little too extreme? I mean, look at he just drops dead. And, and all he did, I mean, he's still bringing a whole bunch of money to the church and laying it at the apostles' feet. All he did is a little lie, but he did so much good. And he's not even given an opportunity to repent. Why is that? What's the big deal with what's going on here? Why, why does God act so severely? And listen to me. We, we need to see the battle that's being waged here. This is a battle over the souls of men. The battle over a controlling influence in Christ's church. You see, what Satan wants is he wants to have his way in the church. And he wants to infiltrate Christ's church. And Christ will have nothing to do with it. Christ is revealing to us how important the purity and unity of his church is. Why? Because Christ takes the church seriously. He takes Satan seriously, and he takes sin seriously. I think far too often, you and I, we do not take the church seriously, Satan seriously, or sin seriously. And, and that is what this text is teaching us. That, that sin is significant. Not just upon the person that commits a sin, but upon the whole body. And remember what Jesus had said in, in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 32. He, he warned his disciples about Satan's desire to what? To sift them like, like wheat. But he also promised to pray that Peter's faith might not fail and that he might be able to strengthen those who were under attack. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing here to Peter and, and to the church. He's strengthening their faith. He's building their resolve. And that's what we should walk away with this text from. Encouragement. The encouragement that God's grace is sufficient. That Satan does want to destroy the church, so we need to be diligent. But God's grace is greater. And he'll continue to build our resolve as we heed his word. But then look what happens next. As this cycle repeats itself. Verses 6 to 8. The young men got up and carried covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. That was the custom of the way that they buried people back in that day because of the hot, humid climate that they didn't want to let, let a body that, that had passed away stay out in the open for very long. Very similar in Papua New Guinea. Now there elapsed an interval about three hours and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes. That was the price. Notice here God's grace to her. She doesn't respond to God's grace, but God's grace is handed to her. On a silver platter as it is, wasn't given to, to her husband. He, he wasn't given an opportunity to repent, but she is. Peter says, are you sure? Is this really the price that you were given? And at that point, if she would have said, okay, no. You see, my husband and I, we came up with this silly plan. And, and, and we wanted the applause of men more than the applause of our God. And, and we've sinned against you and we've sinned against him. Will you forgive us? Will you forgive me? Then she would have found out at that time that it was too late for her husband. But God's grace would have forgiven her. And, and, and the story of Sapphira would have been totally changed. But that isn't what happens, right? She agrees with, with this plan that they had come up with. And, and she says, yes, that's the price. 
And so then we know what, what Peter says next. Look at verse 9. Then Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. His words are, are, are almost prophetic. She hadn't died yet, but now he is telling her, oh, this is exactly what happened to your husband. It's happening. And then we see this too. He says, why have you two agreed not to put us to the test, but to put the Spirit to the test? You see, if the Holy Spirit hadn't shown up that day, I think that that whole church would have just been like, those are some godly folks. Look at how much they've given. Right? Because to be completely honest, it's easy for, for us to fool each other. We, we can make it look like we're all good on the outside. That I have my family completely in tow. That my relationship with my wife is spot on. Because why? Well, because I put my arm around her in church when we sing. When I go home and I'm a terror to my wife. For the rest of the week. Now we can do that with one another. We cannot do that with our God. It is impossible to lie to our God. That, that's what the emphasis is here. That he could not, they could not lie to the Holy Spirit. And what were they thinking? We can't fake it before our God. Look at verse 10. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Again, this relationship that should have been God-honoring, God-focused, encouraging one another towards godliness, went the complete other direction. And, and look what happens in the end. They end up dying on it on exactly the same day and being buried right next to each other. Do you think that that's what they were thinking this day would look like at the end? Of course not. That's the way sin is. Right? Sin is significant, but we don't think of it as significant. You think, oh no, nobody knows, so I can go ahead and pull up that app. No big deal. No, it is a big deal. All sin is significant. Why was Christ, and, and why is he, so quick to punish. And, and why is this such a strong punishment? Because sin is significant. Because Christ wants to keep his church pure. Here, here's a question you might have. And I'm going to have to blast through the answer because I'm already running over time. We're Ananias and Sapphira believers. Have you thought about that? Well, I believe they, they are not, but don't take my word for it. I, I believe God's word gives us a, a, enough of an understanding. Remember back in Acts 4.32, when it talks about the congregation of those meeting. What, what does it say? What's the clarifying word of who was there? It says a congregation of those who believed. Everybody in that church, were, they were believers. And also, remember what I said about how many times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in this text. In particular, it says that he lied, Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. How do you lie to a person that isn't indwelling you? And, unless the Holy Spirit is some sort of mystical thing that just kind of is out in the church now. No, the, the Holy Spirit isn't some sort of mist. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a person who resides in believers. And so the Holy Spirit was there within him. That's how he could lie to the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you not believe that Satan can personally be involved with believers? That somehow we have some sort of force field around us? That, that isn't what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that, that Satan can come and mess with believers. He did with Peter. And we see that in Matthew 16, 21 to 23. I don't believe we, we would have been given Ephesians 6 if Satan would just leave us alone. And in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verses 30 to 32, we, we see that God sometimes actually will punish disciplined believers with death. So all of this fits into the fact that, yes, I think they were believers. But that doesn't mean that they went to spend eternity in, in hell, being eternally punished. No, it means that they made a very poor decision. And let us learn from them. 
Look at Acts 5.11 and we'll finish with this. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. You know, this is the first time that we see the word ekklesia, which is the Greek word for church, in the book of Acts. Isn't that interesting? This is the first time we can see where, where actually God starts, you start considering them, this is the church. And this is Christ letting us know, man, I am going to protect my church. I am all about my church. And it says that they had great fear. You know, this, this relates back to some other words that we saw earlier that had great in it. That there was what? Great testimony. And there was great grace upon them all. Same exact word. Now we see great fear. Why? Because the church should be characterized by that. There should be great grace upon RBC. There should be great powerful preaching, teaching of God's word here at RBC. And there should be great fear of sin and the significance of sin among us as a body. So let me close with two points to ponder, things to consider about this text. Who do you identify more with? Barnabas or Ananias and Sapphira? I think if, if, if you're honest and, and you're like me, most of us desire to look good in other people's eyes. And so what do we do? We do whatever we can to get others' approval. When the reality is what is most important is for God to be pleased with how we're living. How does God want to work in your life to make you more like Barnabas than Ananias and Sapphira? Number two, what's your idea of a perfect church? You know, there, there is no perfect church. Not even the church of the, the apostles was perfect because Ananias and Sapphira were with them. Why would God reveal the sin of Ananias and Sapphira to us? And how significant do you truly believe sin is in your life or in the life of the church? You know, the world would tell us Ah, I don't know if sin is that significant. In fact, it's just a matter of choice. And, and, and if you want sex before marriage, it's your call. If you want divorce without biblical grounds, it's your call. Homosexuality, it's your call. It's all your call. You just do whatever you think seems right or whatever the world is telling you is, is right. But the reality is it is not your call. It's his call. And he's revealed to us what his call is in his word. And he would say, that it does matter, that sin matters and salvation matters. And salvation only comes through his sin. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do bask in your wonderful grace, even your grace that was seen in this account. As we do see the significance of sin in this account, we, we see your whispers of grace, that you are offering grace to Sapphira, just as you continue to offer your grace to us, that we can never outrun your grace. Lord, use this, these verses to remind us of the significance of sin and grant us repentance that we might turn from that sin and run to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.